you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Trevor Etienne's a Georgia Bulldog. We're not talking about that, that at all today. We have Brian Smith, but I need to get that absolute banger off here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Joining me now for Locked On Gators is Brian Smith, Locked On's recruiting insider, the host of Locked On Seminoles. He writes for all hurricanes. So if you hate him, just go and hate him. Um, <laughs> but he's not hes not a fan of either of those teams. Let's get that out the way before the comments start, start filling in. I'm sure you're halfway through your message. Before we talk about Florida Gators early signing day, LinkedIn is a college recruiting sponsor across the Locked On Podcast Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to. Faster, post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. And Brian, we'll talk about Amaris Williams, Adarius Hayes, all that stuff. But I wanted to start on a positive note. This is the Christmas episode. We're going to be relatively <laughs> nice. Okay? We're going to start on a positive note. You kept DJ Lagway and LJ McCray. Yeah. How important is that for this class? Because you look at what happened to the class with the players you lost – you essentially, at one point, were at number three. And then currently, again, this is the Christmas episode. We're recording on Friday, so not expecting anything to happen with early signing day ending today, but or early signing period ending today. But you've fallen to 14, 15. How important was it for Florida to keep DJ Lagway and Al Jimmy? Like, like, is that a job-saving retention of those two players? Like, Because I feel like if you lose those two, you're like, all right, chalk it, we're done. <laughs> Um, to be honest with you, I think the discussion points would have been there, especially with DJ, because A, he headlined the class, B, he gives you credibility, and C, frankly, he's a quarterback. Um, having seen his film numerous times, like his dad used to send me some of his film practices or whatever, that is a really unique football player. And then, of course, losing the kid right down the street from Mainland High School doesn't generally go over very well with uh with the fan base and i get it that mainland high school is a school that florida has always been able to get kids from you know when if they really wanted to it's an hour or so from campus it's not that far they have to be able to get those kids and he's an upside kid on the d-line and with everything else you lost up front which we will certainly certainly get to he's kind of a saver there too they gotta have those guys and miami had arguably the nation's best D-line class. Auburn, much to the bereft of UF, had one of the best D-line Teams they're competing with, they're beating them. So they need to get some of those guys. And then, of course, Alabama and Georgia are still getting a lot of those guys. Those are all their peers. Yeah, that's – that's a, I don't want to say definitively a saving your job, but it helped a lot. So Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like it's great if you're Auburn because uh, you don't have to spend money on evaluating players at all. You just go, oh, Flor Florida's got them committed. We'll, we'll just come take them because you almost <laughs> took LJ. You took Jamonta. You took Amaris. So, yeah, I think I think Auburn, great job. Instead of investing in recruiting and evaluating, you just get to spend that money on players. It, it's, it's a fantastic approach there for Florida. But uh, – <laughs> I also wanted to ask you just I, I obviously DJ Lagway is number four in the country, LJ McCray is number six in the country, but and they are the highest rated players. But is there a, a a favorite player that you have from this Florida Gators class, just what they put on film? I love Kanan Daniels, the running back out of the state of Mississippi. I know you do as well, but I, I like him for a few reasons. Number one, getting kids out of Mississippi is a good thing. The per capita rate for Mississippi players ending up in this thing they call the National Football League is really high. Uh, those kids take it seriously. It is a lifestyle. And the way he runs between the tackles, the way he can run after he gets the football on a screen, anything he does tells me he could eventually be one of those kids sometime. Being where he's from, he's probably not rated where he should be. That's something else. Like it's Out of all the states that have a lot of talent per capita, Mississippi scouted the least. It's really not because nobody lives there. Like it's just up highways, cow fields, and football. That's pretty much what state of Mississippi is. I drive through it 
and it's hard, man. He's going to play for Florida. I would not be surprised at all if he played next year. Kenny Daniels is that good, and he's an every down back. He's going to be strong enough to pass protect, run between the tackles, even though it's the SEC. Oh, pass protection. Thank you. <laughs> We stopped this show to remind you that a certain guy <laughs> that transferred to Georgia could not pass protect. Anyway, might, might as well have me there. <laughs> Ooh, that's not good. But at the same time, this is a kid that they don't always get in every class. Like an every down back is not a guarantee for even a Georgia or somebody out of high school. It's hard to get them. He's just from Mississippi and didn't get rated as high. As a secondary note, Makai Boy Rowe, that kid has elite upside. He's nowhere near ready. He's getting in better shape and all that. And he started that in the last year. He has a chance to be an NFL player as well. And he's a nose guard. The rarest position in football is a true three, four defensive line, situational kind of defense. You do three, three, five, whatever, zero tech. And he's big enough, powerful enough, athletic enough to play it. Florida likes the big guys on the inside. And as a bonus, I know this will make Gators fans just so unhappy they took him from Georgia. I know that bothers you so much. I'm sure you're just so angry about that. But those are the two guys that I'm really curious about. One's just underrated, and the other one has immense upside. So I'm going with those two. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Kane, and you mentioned that you think he can, can play early. Is, is that genuinely just something like – for me, I, I think he can also because I was looking at – when watching his film, very limited film. Um, but I feel like his vision was his best trait for me. And so I'm looking at, at someone like that, and I'm like, well – vision is a translatable thing like like you could watch speed in high school film and it's like well they might just be playing lower ranked slower guys you could watch them bowl people over and it's like okay you're not gonna do that in the sec like even uh i have florida gators tight end hayden hansen on the show every week during the season and in his high school film he's just bowling dudes over like he's, he's almost six seven 260 and he's just trucking people and again so i think it was missouri he was he got just taken out and uh and I spoke to him and he was just like they go a lot lower in the SEC than they do in high school uh so, so bowling people over is not a thing so is it the vision that helps Kanan translate over most uh, as well as just being the every down skill set? Well, that helps him get into the position to make the move and then turn on the speed. If you don't make that first guy miss and set up your move because you see it coming in you know close quarters, it's over. Uh, the two guys that I think had the best vision of anybody I ever saw were Marcus Allen and Emmett Smith. One of them being obviously a former Gator, but they, they weren't necessarily the fastest guy on the field, but fast, but they saw things before it happened and they didn't take as many direct hits because of it. They were great in goal line. Situation. You can make the argument. Those are two best goal line backs ever. You could at least put that in the argument. Just got vision, short yardage. Anytime it's crowded, Knowing when to make that cut, Daniels is really good at it too. So that, that's a good point by you. Yeah, and then about Makai Boyro, Florida hired their defensive line coach, Gerald Chapman, from Tulane. Uh, you got LJ McCray and and uh, you got Brian Taylor from JUCO on the defensive lines. So you, you've you lost a Morris, yes. You lost Jamont at Edge, who would have been working with Mike Peterson. But for Florida, you, you've added to this defensive line or retained guys that were committed at least – with a, a new defensive line coach, how hard is that to do? Because for Makai Boyro, you got him, your assistant D line coach got him to commit back to you because he committed initially, decommitted, and then your assistant D line coach got him to commit back. But how important is it to retain them? Because I was told at least that part of that was why LJ McCray initially postponed his signing because Wednesday morning came and he was like, yeah, not signing today. And then Florida announced their D line hire and LJ eventually signed i think having comfort with the people that you're going to work directly with is probably the number one thing that allows a kid to sign or not sign depending on circumstance with any school florida included talk about it all the time it's not what's on the shirt it's the person wearing the shirt if you don't have a relationship with a guy and like obviously florida staff is put it kindly in flux i would say that revolving is door. really hard revolving door <laughs> Okay, well, we could go with that. That was what Brandon said, not me, just so everybody knows that. I just think that it's hard, and like LJ is a really easygoing kid, but he just like anybody else was going to want to know, okay, who's this individual that I'm quote-unquote entrusting my potential NFL future with? 
Oh, by the way, I, I don't, I don't really know him. That's got to be uneasy. So I'm not mad at LJ at all. I was shocked that he signed with Florida in any capacity now or in February. I didn't think he was going to go to Florida. I thought he was going to go to Auburn. Yeah. And for LJ specifically, where do you kind of view him long term? Because I know we've had this conversation before, but things might change. But for LJ, he's been recruited by Mike Peterson for the most part, our outside linebackers coach, because he wants to play Jack, but understands there's a possibility he could be playing that defensive end spot, which is why the defensive line coach matters for him, even though, again, he's been recruited primarily by Mike Peterson. So where do you view him kind of long term settling in? When I went to see him in September, and I didn't, I should have asked him, <clears throat> but I, I guess that he was in the 275 range. He might have been a little lighter. Sometimes it's hard to tell, but he's got big hips and he's a long kid. He's at least 6'5". Big dude. And I'm like, if he's that big now, the conservative number that you put on kids in college is 20 pounds. Let's say I was wrong and he's 265. He'd still be 285. There are no 285 guys that I know playing outside linebacker. Yeah, Florida Jack this past year is 255. Yeah, it's... Like 245 to 260, it's been that way for 40 years. Lawrence Taylor is 255, 260. It's been that way forever. So I'd imagine that he's going to put his hand in the dirt except for special circumstances that are like goal line or something of that nature, or if they go with a true three-man line. This is where Makai Barreau comes in and nose guards in general. Maybe you stand him up for something to kind of confuse a team, but he's going to be a strong side defensive end in a 3-4 or he's going to be a three tech slash, you know, swing player at, at strong side in and a four three. And it would behoove him to learn both because the money is better because half the NFL teams run some version of a three, four. It's not like college. There, there aren't enough nose guards for all the college teams to do it. It's just, there aren't that many of them, but in the NFL they do. So if he learns both, he'd be better off, but he ain't playing outside linebacker for 10 minutes. In my opinion, I just don't see it. Yeah. I uh... Big, big freaking dude. I'm really, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would you need him. You know. <laughs> yeah, I think someone that's 30 pounds heavier when he gets bulked up uh, yeah, than the current cool. Jack. Yeah, I, I, I don't see that one happening too much. But again, hey, good on him for being like, let me see the D line coach before I before I oh, sign. Absolutely. Anything. So great business decision by him there. But other business decisions that we we do have to talk about because it was early signing period and bad things happen to Florida Gators fans just seemingly endlessly. Uh, it's really, <laughs> it's really fun. There's like that meme. That's just like when, when it's like, what God, why do you give me your toughest battles? And he's just like, how are you still alive? And it's like, that's just <laughs> Gators fan base there. Um, Cause it, it, it's a wild time here, but for Florida, you lost Amaris Williams, who by the way, Amaris, I've been pronouncing it poorly the, this entire time. I haven't put a little voice memo on Twitter. So you lost Amaris Williams, you lost Adarius Hayes, and you lost Isaiah Williams all on the early signing day. And you lost Xavier Filsimi prior to, it was what, Monday that he announced that he was flipping to Texas. Yep. I mean, I, I don't even know what the hell to say about that. You, you lost two of your top five commits with Filsimi and Amaris. How do I put this ever so softly? Not great. Um, look, somebody asked me for the SEC, give me the team that you thought won today and give me the team that you thought lost today. I picked Texas for winning the day because in my opinion, they're starting to get to the point they're bolstered their lines enough that they're pretty damn close to what two schools are in Tuscaloosa and Athens. That does not bode well for anybody else because they can obviously throw it around. And the team, who do you think I picked for losing today in the SEC? What team do you think would that be, Brandon? Who do you, who do you think I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> can I say that one? Uh, yeah, I picked Ford. I'm like, this is not hard. It, it's, it's the forest for the trees here. Don't miss the big gift horse. You know, it's right there in front of you. They just lost too many guys. It's Florida. They had a top five class, and now they don't have a top ten. This is going to set the program back. I'm not sure. I'll just go ahead and ask. You're probably going to ask me this anyway. So here we go. Barring something unforeseen, I'm not sure how this current staff is going to survive this beyond this next season with the schedule they have. I think this will be their demise. Ah, uh, could be. My my stance has not changed from, from what it's been for 
a couple months at this point now. I think you give Billy Napier another season, and there's two potential outcomes. One, he shocks you and turns it all around and, and starts to succeed, which is obviously the less likely outcome. But the other outcome is that he gets fired, your AD gets fired, maybe you get some foundational change at Florida, and things start trending upward again. So that that's why I'm, I'm fully on board. Give him another year, and either way, Florida wins. You either start winning games or, or you get – strong foundational change that I desperately think Florida needs um, in the athletic department, UAA, everything. So yeah, I, I, I don't know how, I don't know how I could confidently look at this staff and say, you've shown me that you'll turn things around because it just, it just doesn't seem like that. And even the staff is currently still undergoing transitional periods. Just lost Jay Bateman linebacker coach to Texas A&M to be their defensive coordinator uh, $1.5 million contract or salary. Great for him. Um, but he also brought in Miles Graham, had a Darius Hayes for quite some time, brought in Aaron Childs, so was, and was voted one of the best recruiters in the country this season, and now you lost him. I, I mean, first off, let, let's talk about the timing of it, because the day after early signing day is when the hire is made. Report is that he didn't get offered the job fully until that morning, so he couldn't have said, and then immediately Texas a and media leaked it out that he was there, so he couldn't have a conversation with anybody. Um, but Ernest Graham then sends out a tweet that is just... The dry communication or no communication, no calls, dry experience. That can't look good for Florida when we've spent a lot of time talking about public perception L's. I mean, if there's a lot of ways this can go, and I'm a guy that will throw you under the bus if I think it's warranted, I think this is more a person that left problem than it is Florida problem. Here's one of the things that happens, and this has been going on forever. A coach knows he's going to leave, but he has friends and or like some kind of contract deal with the school. They know they're leaving and they just bold face lie. It happens a lot. It's just there's no good way to do it because the coaching changes all happen in December, and that's when signing day is. Do I really believe he didn't know he was leaving and he got the offer the day after and he said, I'll just take it? I mean, that's utterly ridiculous. So whether he lied to the recruits or whether or not Bateman misled them, I, I really don't see how it's not both. There's no way I'm buying that he just got the offer that morning and left. I'm sorry. Um, at the same time, he is a good football coach and all that. He's got some history, but a and you know, is probably giving him more money. It's a different opportunity, so I understand that. I don't know what all the other reasons would be for him to wait because I'm sure there was some kind of contact before. He, I'm, I'm going to go on and let me guess that he knows Mike Denver, or uh, excuse me, he, he knows the coaching staff in a &M. He's probably worked with two or three of them at some capacity. That's how this usually works. Everybody knows everybody. But to not tell the kids on signing day is rough for me. That, that bothers me. Yep, and uh, and makes Florida look bad too because Ernest Graham sent the tweet out, so it just makes. Uh, and he's a legacy kid too, bro. I mean, like his daddy could play, and you know he's a loyal Gator, and they moved him down to Gainesville, and holy yeah, moly, moved, moved from Georgia to where is uh, was Atlanta. he Buford before? Uh, I think he was at one of the private schools in the Greater yeah. Atlanta. Um, but and, it's just, but now who it's cares? Yeah, yeah, it's he's good. Yeah, it's 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 a wild situation. If you're Florida, because again, yes, I I do think that it was Jay Bateman that messed up more than anyone else. Um, but I just I feel like that was like a snaky way to go out. Like wait till signing day, kids sign, and then and then you leave. Uh, even if you did get the offer that morning, which I don't think is what happened, but even if you did get the offer that morning, I feel like you could have told the kids like, hey, I might be bolting out of here really soon. Um, but, just, but, but if you're Florida, we talked about relationships a ton that makes you look bad reputation wise. Absolutely. So I mean, how, how do you even bounce back from that? Even we'll, we'll take a look forward right now in 2025 kid, DJ Pickett, Zephyr Hills. Well, you, yeah, yeah. We talked about him where I think you were like, oh yeah, eighth grade. I knew that he was going to be a highly ranked kid. Like he, he was just 
a dog, sim- simply put, yeah. and put out his top five. Florida not in it. Uh, and I feel like that's something where you should you should probably be in the top five at this point in time. But what does Florida do moving forward? They have to, for lack of a better term, recalculate not only their internal, but what meetings they have. They've, they've got about a two-month window here. Because once you get to March and all the spring visits and stuff happen, it's too late. What you do from really like January for uh, kids can't really do much right now. It's Christmas break. But once you get to January and these kids start taking unofficial visits from the class of 25, 26 and onward, you need to have them believing that your program is a viable option on the field, off the field, trust them. Parents can send their kids to the institution and, Trust them in, you know, economically, trust them to get better football, obviously academics. It is a school of higher learning, all the above. Right now, let's not kid ourselves. Other schools that recruit against Florida and don't like Florida are going to drop bombs with stuff like this. That's how negative recruiting works. And unfortunately, in this case, it's just true. So it's awkward. Like, this is what happened there. Why would you go there? That's all they got to say. It's a three-second sentence they, they spit out. And they just let the kid ponder it. And that'll that'll impact parents and the coaches they have, the people around them, their parents, their brother, whatever, their sister. So they need to have a plan to get people in and talk to them. This is what's going to be different now. They, I mean, they got to own it first off. That's coaches don't like admitting fault. That, that is something I've learned the hard way for a long time. And if they try to fight back on this too much, it'll bite them. I'm telling you right now, it will bite them. Florida kids in particular are the most difficult to win over in the entire country. It doesn't matter what school you are. And they got to start at home, Tampa, Orlando, Daytona, all the way up to Tallahassee, Jacksonville, the central and north central part of Florida. They should win over 50% of the battles. But right now, they're not. And they're probably not based off what's happened here recently on the field and now off with the Bateman situation. So they've got to have a definitive plan where the the wagons are circled, and this is how we're going to attack the next class because that's going to impact what the boosters think. Because next year is going to be hard, you know. But if they've got a plan and they're rolling and recruiting, that could also save their job. It starts right now. I mean, right now, today. This is how we're going to do it, and this is the definitive plan. It, it comes from the recruiting staff, all the mail you send out, how you communicate. This is the plan for everybody congruent because obviously they weren't very congruent with this class, with guys leaving at the day. I mean, that's partially on Napier. But again, I think I'm not going to blame him so much for that. I, I highly doubt he had the, the full down low on what was going with that. That's not Billy's fault. But it's still going to be something that's thrown on him. He's going to get cannibalized by it if he allows it to fester. So they got to have that plan, and they got to get kids between now and the end of spring ball. It needs to be constant, and Pickett needs to be one. I don't care if he put out his top five. I'm sure I'll talk to DJ soon, but you have to recruit him until he gives you a restraining order. He is the rarest DB I have ever scouted at his age when he was in eighth grade. He was a six one and a half corner that I would have taken in eighth grade. Literally. For him not to have a top five and he lives on the edge of Tampa is horrific for Florida. It is unbelievable. So they've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, we'll end on that super positive note. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's things are going well in Gator Nation. This team will be the death of me. Thank you very <laughs> much, Brian. Brian is Locked On's recruiting insider. Catch him all throughout the Locked On uh, Locked On College channel. Catch him on Locked On Seminoles every day. As unfortunate that as that is, if you want to give him hate, go ahead. I'm sure I'm sure he'll appreciate the comments. He loves it. He's he's a he's a fun guy. Um, but we'll be back uh, next 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 year. Technically, I guess, because yeah, we'll see. But thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, sir. Have a great one. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day every day. We are available daily and free to listen to the podcast. We'll be back tomorrow for more Florida Gators football. We're talking more early signing day. We're probably going to wrap up with the early signing day coverage tomorrow, talking about biggest impact freshmen. Uh, and then we're going to move to transfer portal, coaching hires. Let's finish the year strong, right? And let's start 2024 off hot. For Lockdown Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole Nine Sports, Giants, Country, NFL 33. And I'll see you all tomorrow.